Hey first graders, this week in garden, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about glowing insects, all right? Because there are all sorts of really cool animals out there that create their own light. So we're gonna talk about them, we're gonna learn about them, and then we're gonna get to use the glow sticks that were in your garden kit, all right? So this is the sheet we're gonna go over today, okay? We're gonna take a trip to New Zealand and learn about glowworm caves. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about beetle anatomy. All right, so go ahead, get this sheet out, okay? If you have your glow sticks, you can go ahead and get those out. And if you have your little glow in the dark uh, dots, okay, we can go ahead and get those out too because we're gonna have some fun with them. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get this sheet out and we're gonna start talking about traveling to New Zealand and the glowworm caves that are there. We're also gonna get to read some of this book, Bright in the Night, which is a great book. It is by Lena Sogberg, and it is all about how animals glow and use color to kind of stand out. And so you'll notice that it covers everything because insects aren't the only cool thing that grow. Okay, it covers everything from um, gems that grow under UV lights to glowing mushrooms. Wouldn't that be cool in a school garden to have a little glow in the dark section? Okay. Um, some different animals like butterflies and frogs. And then of course, our glowworms as well and some different insects. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get out our glowworm sheet. And I'm gonna switch to our document camera so that we can go over the sheet together. All right. All right, so today what we're gonna do is we are gonna follow Evelyn, remember our entomologist friend, all around the world and we are going to end up in a special country called New Zealand. So Evelyn has heard about a special cave in New Zealand that the local Maoris, which are the indigenous people in New Zealand, say has glowing strings hanging from the ceiling. She wants you to go with her to investigate this phenomenon called bioluminescence. Some animals are able to make their own light through chemical reactions. While the caves in New Zealand are actually full of gnat larvae, most glowworms are larval beetles. So as adults, they will become a beetle like the insect below. Okay, and so these are these glowworm caves in New Zealand. They're beautiful caves where basically the larva drips down from the ceiling. You can see it almost looks like chains, right? And so what we're gonna do first is we're gonna color the area on the map where you would find the glowworm caves in New Zealand. So if anybody, has ever been to New Zealand or maybe done a country report on New Zealand. New Zealand is in the Pacific Ocean. It's an island country, okay? And you can see here's the continent of Australia. New Zealand's actually not on this map. New Zealand's over here. It's just kind of to the south, okay? So we're gonna kind of do a little arrow this way, okay? And New Zealand's right here on the map. All right, so now that we've colored in New Zealand where we've traveled, Okay, so far we remember we were in North America yes, uh, last time we talked for talking about uh, North American honeybees. Okay, so we've been there. We were in Asia for the silkworms. Okay, so we were traveling all over the world. So today we're in New Zealand. All right, and so these gnats that are in this cave are really, really cool little creatures. So this, this is the book that I was talking about, That Dark in the Night. Okay, and so you can see if you've ever been um, to New Zealand, they basically give tours. I, I was fortunate enough to go last year. And so you go in this cave and the cave has these rivers going through it and you get into a boat and they turn off. There's no lights in these caves. And all you can see are these, the ceilings that are lit up with these beautiful creatures, okay? In New Zealand and Australia, there are caves filled with so many glowing insects that the roof looks like it's covered with stars. The insects that live there are known as glowworms, but they are actually a kind of gnat. The larva of this glowworm spins long glowing threads that hang down from the cave roof like shining beads. Other insects are drawn to the light and get caught in the sticky threads. Then they become the larva's dinner. When there is the best chance of finding food, the glowworms shine their brightest. So you can see this is that life cycle right here. So the New Zealand glowworm is the larva Okay, and eventually it will turn into these little gnats. All right, and some more creepy crawlies. You can see 
If you shine ultraviolet light on a scorpion, it glows blue or green. People think that the scorpion's light helps it to find dark places to hide. The giant cockroach also uses light in a clever way. Luminous bacteria live on its body, and in the dark, they make the cockroach look just like a poisonous click beetle. With this trick, the bacteria help scare away animals who want to eat the cockroach. Isn't that cool? So if you were to look at a scorpion with black light, okay, it glows this either blue or green. And this is that giant cockroach that looks like the click beetle, okay? And this is the wire worm right here. So there are certain worms that glow as well. And then this is a termite skyscraper. So on the savanna in Brazil, you can see the termite mounds looking like glittering skyscrapers in the night. The glow isn't made by termites, but the click beetle larvae, which live in the holes on the outside of the termite mound. Their glowing heads attract smaller insects into the holes where the larvae can eat them. Okay? So it's really cool. Most animals will glow to attract other animals to eat. Okay, that's one of the biggest reasons why animals glow. There are all sorts of deep ocean fish, okay, that glow in the dark. You can see here it's an angler fish. Okay, there's all sorts of really cool things. Um, there's different bioluminescence, okay, that will glow, which are little teeny, teeny tiny animals that glow in the ocean. There's all sorts of really cool things. So anyway, this is kind of full of different animals that glow, but we talked about some insects, the mushrooms. Oh, there's a jumping spider that glows. The fire centipede is frightened or injured. Its body makes glowing slime. The glow worm, you can see here, okay, those glow. A blinking snail lays eggs that glow. Some chameleons, okay, will kind of have glowing patterns. The fireflies, of course, that's a big one. Certain butterflies, a railroad worm. It's actually the larva of a beetle called ooh, Frixithrix. At night, the glowing dots along its body make it look like a train with lights in the windows. A polka dotted tree frog. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and if you have your glow stick, Okay, you can go ahead and crack your glow stick. And what happens is, okay, these are chemicals, they're not mixed, but when you crack it, it creates, can you see it glow? Isn't that cool? It creates a chemical reaction. All right, so now once I crack it, okay, and you can just do it once, it usually starts to kind of mix, wiggle it back and forth. You don't want to wiggle it too hard because you don't want to break it. But it'll start to create that chemical reaction that glows. So when animals do it, it's called bioluminescence. Bio means life, okay? Lumen is light, so life light, all right? And so these, these are your glow sticks, okay? You can take them, you can use them, put them on your nightstand, whatever you want, okay? If you wanna tape them here, you can tape, it says tape glow stick here, you can do that, okay? It's up to you, I'm gonna go ahead and do that just because my, my desk is a little uneven, so it rolls right now. Okay, that's why I've got my bioluminescence here. Boop. Perfect. So we've colored in New Zealand. Okay, name some other animals that can glow. So from the book that we just read, you can draw a picture of it. So I really love that train caterpillar, remember? And it said it lights up the dots that kind of look like train windows. So that's my train caterpillar. Can you maybe think of another one? What's another one? Another animal that glows. Oh, the scorpion, right? Now, scorpions, they have eight legs. So is a scorpion, who can tell me, is a scorpion an insect if it has eight legs? No, it's an arachnid, right? Those front ones are kind of like little pinchers. Okay, so scorpion, they can glow in the dark. And then of course they have those worms, right? So little worms, I'm just gonna do a little worm. And you can write the word too, it's up to you. You can draw pictures or words. Okay, but I drew some of my other animals that can glow in the dark right here. Perfect. And so last up, most of the things that were glowing in the dark are a certain part of a life cycle. 
and a lot of them will turn into beetles. So can anybody think of a really cool beetle that goes through a different life cycle? You might have seen them in the garden. I've got them right here. What's this beetle called? It's a ladybug, that's right. Okay, so ladybugs, remember, this is how we know a ladybug, usually, right? This is a big toy ladybug, so more, usually they're much smaller than this. But when you look at a ladybug, okay, it's going to start off as eggs, because all insects lay eggs. But there's two phases in between the egg and the adult ladybug, okay? Ladybugs actually, once they hatch from their eggs, they look like this, with the black and kind of orange. They don't have a red shell at all. And this is their larva phase. Isn't that cool? So when you see something like this, they're much smaller. Okay, but again, they have six legs. They've got kind of that segmented body. Okay, that is their larva phase. And then they go through this pupa phase where they basically attach to a leaf. So you can see it's attached to a leaf. And then it kind of gets hard right here. And that is the pupa phase of a ladybug. Okay, so you can see, even though we think this is what a ladybug looks like, really, it goes through all these different changes to turn into the adult ladybug. So it goes from eggs to larva to pupa to ladybug. All right, and so same thing with a lot of these glow-in-the-dark animals. They are starting out life looking very different and maybe a little bit bioluminescent, and then they eventually end up becoming a beetle. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to create a little glow-in-the-dark beetle. So you're going to take your pens, okay, and beetles have three body parts because they are an insect. They have six legs, three body parts. You can see six legs, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, and three body parts. And I put the body parts in trace letters to the left of the beetle. So the first body part is the head. Okay, and the ladybug's like this too. The ladybug has its little head right here. This is its head, okay? Now, the second body part is the thorax right here. T-H-O-R-A-X, thorax. Okay, and on the ladybug, that's this part right here, okay? So it's between the head and the abdomen. And then the last body part is the abdomen, Perfect. Okay, so three body parts, head, thorax, abdomen, and six legs. And that's how you know it's an insect. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we are going to just use those dots that I gave you in your garden kit. Okay, they're glow-in-the-dark little polka dots. And you can make your beetle glow-in-the-dark. So you can use these ones. Okay, you'll notice that these have kind of been next to a light, but when you cover them up and get them dark, they're going to glow-in-the-dark. Okay? So if you want, you can make little patterns on your beetle. Okay. Put a couple polka dots on there. Make your beetle a little glow-in-the-dark beetle. And you can't really see. Whoop, there we go. He's got glow-in-the-dark little dots on him. Okay. You can use these if you want to cut your beetle out and put them on a wall and see them light up tonight. Okay. When you go to bed, that's totally fine too. These are yours to so do with what you want now. All right. Perfect. All right. So that, my friends, is our lesson on glowworms in New Zealand, all right? So just remember, the cool thing about insects is just because we see them in one phase doesn't mean that they didn't look very different in a different life cycle, okay? They're still the same little critter. It's just a different life cycle that they're in. All right, nice work. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little bit about the glowworm caves in New Zealand and traveling in our mind to a really cool island country, okay, with some really cool insects. Think about all the different creatures out there that make their own light, all right? It would be really cool if we had that ability, right? We wouldn't need night lights if we were scared. It'd be pretty neat. So you guys have gone ahead and you've used your glow sticks, okay? We've seen the chemical reaction that can occur to create light, all right? You've created your own little glow-in-the-dark beetle. Awesome work. And then now these are yours to do with what you want. All right, so if you want, you can go ahead and put them in your room later tonight and think about other cool things that glow. All right, and we will see you next. Hey, first graders, 
We are going to learn a little bit about butterflies today, and we are going to be traveling to South America to talk a little bit about the blue morpho. And so if you have the sheet, you can go ahead and get it out. Okay. And then if you have this sheet, all right, you can get this one out. And we're going to be looking at some example butterflies from the Butterfly House book, which I love because it has all sorts of really cool examples of different moths and butterflies. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the differences between each. Okay, so again, you're going to get out this butterfly. Originally, I was thinking it would be a lacing card, and you actually have um, a shoelace in your garden kit to lace with. Um, but I couldn't hole punch around here, so we're going to skip that for now. Okay, and we're going to color it and talk about symmetry. And then we are going to use this sheet to kick us off with our lesson. All right, so go ahead and get these out. If you don't have them, you're just going to follow along with a piece of paper or whiteboard. All right, and then use what you can. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about butterflies because hopefully you've seen one in nature. Okay, they're kind of flying all around. You might not have seen some of the more popular ones or the colorful ones, but chances are you've seen at least a moth or like a, a cabbage moth. Okay, or a cabbage butterfly, which are usually like the little white ones that are flying around. This one's a cabbage moth. Okay. Um, so think about where you've seen them and what they've been doing. All right. And we're going to learn a little bit more as we go along in the lesson. All right. All right. So today what we're going to do, Evelyn's asked us to go to South America to study some butterflies. And in South America, there is a beautiful thing called the rainforest right, the Amazon rainforest. And so there are a lot of really great species of animals that live there. And one of them is this blue morpho butterfly. So Evelyn has been asked to come examine how various butterflies live in different climates and environments. We will look at the phases of the life cycle of butterflies and patterns and symmetry of the insects and how a butterfly uses its different body parts. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna think about where in the world we are. And we are in South America. So can anybody find South America on this map? Remember, we did the bees in North America. Okay. We've talked about the New Zealand glowworms, which are over here by Australia. We've talked about the silkworm cocoons in Asia. Right. South America is down here. So North America here where we live. South America is down here. So we're going to take our pen and we're going to color in South America. Perfect. All right, so that's South America where we're going to be talking a little bit about today. So butterflies are really cool creatures. You can see here I have, this is a cabbage butterfly, okay? And it's kind of hard because I know it's clear, so it gets a little trickier. But butterflies have different life cycles to them. Okay, I think most of us have seen that life cycle of it starts off as, here we go, as an egg. Okay, and then it goes into this caterpillar, and then it makes a cocoon, and it comes out of the cocoon, this butterfly or moth. All right, and so you can see this is an actual one here that they've kind of imposed over it. All right, and so the butterfly, put it on my hand, there we go. They are among the first butterflies we see in spring, these cabbage butterflies. The adult butterflies have black spots and help to pollinate plants, especially food plants. Hence why they're called cabbage. Okay, Cabbage butterflies lay their eggs on plants such as broccoli or cabbage, and the eggs usually hatch within four to five days, depending on the temperature. Right, Warmer temperature is going to hatch faster. The larvae are green with yellow stripes and transform into chrysalises in about two and a half weeks. So they only stay in this caterpillar phase for about two and a half weeks. All right, And the butterflies emerge from the chrysalises in two to three weeks and are about two inches wide. So basically, once they come from the caterpillar and they make their chrysalis or cocoon, okay, they almost liquefy. They basically have to reinvent themselves, and then they emerge as this beautiful butterfly. Okay, so blue morphos, which live in the Amazon, they go through much the same process. All right, and so butterflies, they are insects, right? They have different parts of their body, just like all the other insects. But what's really cool about butterflies are that they are symmetrical. So can anybody think about what symmetrical might mean? Okay. 
Humans are symmetrical, not in all ways, but in some. What else is symmetrical? Symmetrical basically means that you can, I've given you some examples here while you're thinking about it. You can draw a line down the middle okay, and divide it in half and it's going to be the same. Right, so you can see here, this is usually how we cut hearts out of paper, right? Is we fold it in half and we cut this side. Okay, and then what happens when you unfold that paper? You get this side of the heart too, right? It's very cool. But is the heart symmetrical the other way? If you were to do it this way, do a line through it this way, would it be symmetrical? No, it wouldn't, right? It doesn't equal out. And so definitely people are the same way. If you look at your face, right? This is an example of the butterfly here. But if you look at your face, you can draw a line down the middle and you've got an eye and eye, a nose in the middle, okay? Mouth, mouth. So butterflies are the same way. You can do it this way and the butterfly will be symmetrical. If you drew a line this way, is the butterfly symmetrical? No right? Because this top doesn't match the bottom. But like a square, you can do it diagonal, it's symmetrical. Okay, you can do it this way, it's symmetrical. It is symmetrical pretty much no matter how you cut it. So butterflies are symmetrical animals, meaning that if we were to cut them down the middle, they would be the same on both sides. Some shapes are symmetrical with only one line, like butterflies, while other shapes like a square are symmetrical in multiple ways. Take a look at the butterfly and moth outlines on the left and draw where you think the line of symmetry should go for the animals. Then draw a symmetrical pattern on the wings of the moth or butterfly. So moths fly around at night, okay? And a big divide, big thing that's different between the two is that moths have these feathery antenna. Okay, so based on that, which one do you think is the moth? This top one is the moth, right? And if we draw a line here, okay? Oops, it's not, it's not perfect. Sorry. It's going to be symmetrical, right? If we were to fold this in half, it is symmetrical. So that is my symmetrical line. And then for the butterfly, should we draw it this way? No, that wouldn't be symmetrical. But if we do it this way, okay, again, it's kind of a challenge to do it right. But that is going to be a symmetrical line. You fold it in half, all right? And we're going to talk a little bit about that when we do our butterfly art as well, okay? All right, so the butterfly parts of the animal, All right? We're gonna go ahead and work on this now. So the butterfly parts, we are gonna label the different parts of the animal, okay? So the first one is these here, which are up top. So can anybody tell me what these little things are on the very top of their head? Do you may think they know? Yeah, they're antenna. Okay, so A, N, T, E, and N, A, antenna. Now, antenna are located on the insect's head. Okay, and insects, remember, they have six legs and they have three body parts, just like we learned with the beetles. So they have the head, then they have the middle part of their body. Can anybody remember what the middle part of their body is called? It starts with a T. It's the thorax. Okay, so this line here is going to the middle of their body. So T-H-O-R-A-X. Kind of like Lorax. Remember the Lorax in um, Dr. Seuss, the Dr. Seuss book? So thorax is the middle part. And then the end is called the abdomen. A B D O M E N abdomen. Perfect. And then the last body part we're going to label is what they fly with. What are these beautiful things that they fly with? It's their wings. Perfect. All right. So you guys have gone ahead and we have labeled our butterflies of South America sheet with the blue morpho. And now what we're going to do is we are going to get ready to go into our butterfly drawing. So get out some markers if you have some markers, okay? And meet back here for our butterfly drawing. Yeah. 
All right, so for the last part of our lesson, what we're gonna do is we are going to be working on our butterfly. It was a lacing card, now we're just gonna go ahead and call it a butterfly coloring. But what you're gonna notice, okay, like we talked about with our sheet here, is the symmetry, right? So if we were gonna fold this in half this way, it is symmetric. So this side is the same as this side, right? You could really use your scissors and cut it out and it would be the same when you unfurled it, okay? It is symmetrical. So whatever we draw on this side, we're gonna have to mirror on this side. Now, is it symmetrical this way if we cut it out? No, right? These top parts of the wingspans are different. The antenna are up here, not down below. So this is the line of symmetry. So as you're coloring, okay, I want you to just be thinking about that as like if I draw a couple pink lines, right? Let's see, if I do three pink lines here, I am going to need to keep it symmetrical and draw three pink lines over here. Okay, and again, it doesn't have to be perfect, all right? You can see they don't match totally, but I want it close enough, all right? So you can tell that you guys know that it's symmetrical. Okay, so whatever you do on one side, you're gonna go ahead and do on the other side. And then you're gonna do it that way, all right? And so say I want to color this one in. I can't leave this one colored and this one not because again, we want them to be symmetrical. Okay, so you're gonna work on coloring and you can do whatever patterns you want. Okay, you can just kind of start drawing. You're creating your own little butterfly pattern. All right, so think about what colors you think you might like. Think about where this butterfly might live because chances are it's gonna to try to kind of blend into its environment and use those colors. Okay, so you're gonna keep working, keep drawing. Maybe I'm gonna do some little dots here. So if I do dots on this side, I gotta do dots on this side. Okay. You can get as creative with this as you want. It is your butterfly or moth. So now if you wanted to make this into a moth, okay, what would you add? Can anybody think about what you might add? That's one of the major differences, right? It's these little antenna. Moths have kind of feather-like antenna, bushier, like bushy eyebrows. So we're going to kind of do that. Now, chances are it might be more of a moth. Okay, moths also usually fly around at night. Okay, so you can take that into account. All right, so I've gone ahead and done mine. What I'm gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and look at the butterfly house. And so you can see all the different beautiful types of butterflies that are in this book. I'm gonna hold it up and read it, but you kind of get an idea. You can see the symmetry, right? If we divide this butterfly in half, okay, this half will match this half, right? If we put a line here, these halves are the same. All right, so while you're coloring, I'm gonna look, go ahead and read through this, and you can use some of this as inspiration for your drawing. All right, so these examples are swallowtail butterflies. You can see these are the beautiful, they kind of have these little extensions on their tails. This is a beautiful family that gets its name from the tails of the hind wings, which look like the tails of swallow birds. However, don't be fooled. It's not all species that have these tails. They can be large and colorful with magnificent markings and shiny wings, like the Ulysses butterfly. Many mimic the pattern of butterflies that taste bad to protect them from predators. Some swallowtail caterpillars have fake eye spots to make them look like the heads of snakes. One of the most famous in this family, the Ulysses butterfly, the males are curious about anything that is colored blue. So you can see here, all oh, these beautiful butterflies. So some of them have these extensions right here. Okay, you can see up here, but there are these beautiful butterflies. And again, notice the symmetry. Okay, and some of them have the dots there. So these are swallowtail butterflies. These ones are yellow, whites, and sulfurs. So this family gets its name from its coloring. 
These butterflies don't have the bold patterns of some of the other families, but they are often beautiful yellow and orange colors marked with a few black spots. And a group of butterflies is called a flutter. Isn't that cool? That's a flutter of butterflies right there. So these are good examples. These ones are metal marks. The metal mark butterflies get their name from the small metallic spots often found on their wings. So metallic spots can be shiny, okay, and they kind of reflect the light. So those are really cool examples. And these are skippers. There are 3,500 species in this family, which are moth-like in their appearance. Many fly during daytime, but others fly at dusk. Okay, so again, you can kind of see some of the, the antenna. The beautiful markings. These ones are tiger moths, right? There are 11,000 species in this family, which often have striking geometric markings in orange, black, and white, like a tiger. They have fuzzy bodies, okay, and bold colors. Aren't they pretty? And then these are geometric moths. Just look at these. I love the colors of these. Okay, that's that's a caterpillar, right? But the adults here, they're really cool looking. The geometer moths are a very large family of moths with around 23,000 species named so far. They have their thin abdomens and broad wings, which make them look a lot like butterflies. These moths can be experts in camouflage. The wavy patterns and shapes on their wings often blend into the background. One species in particular is very special, the peppered moth. These little moths' adaptation to their environment is a famous example of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. The pale moths gradually become darker for camouflage against sooty trees in the city. This helped protect them from predators. In the countryside, pale moths thrive because they were camouflaged against clean, pale trees. Isn't that cool? So different moths in the environment have learned to blend in. So number nine is the peppered moth. So you can see that's this moth right here. So anyway, these are all sorts of really cool examples of moths and butterflies. So as you're working on your drawing, just think about all the cool adaptations and all the cool patterns that you can see on the examples. All right, and then you can come up with your own. And if you wanna name your butterfly or moth, you can put their name up here, okay? But that is it for our lesson today. All right, you guys, have a great week. I will see you next time. Bye.